Good morning. My name is Bradley Worth. I'm the Rector Emeritus of All Saints Episcopal Church, Whitefish, Columbia Falls. Welcome to our Facebook screening. Having been advised by the General Counsel to the Governor, the Bishop of Montana has directed the suspension of live streaming of the Holy Eucharist, as we can no longer use creative ways to distribute communion during this time of mandated sheltering in place. To that end this morning, we are doing something called anti-communion, or the service basically going through the prayers of the people and the general confession. This, or something not unlike it, will be our practice until the governor is able to lift the order. This service goes back in history to something called the Mass of the Catechumens in the very, very early church during the first centuries of Christianity, those who were new to the faith and not yet baptized would experience something very much like what we will have this morning because they would have been asked to leave prior to the service of the Word transitioning to the service of Holy Communion. Again, welcome. Our opening hymn is number 495. <clears throat> Help to sing our Savior's merits. Help 
We continue now on page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His, His mercy, mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and very changes of the world our hearts may surely there be fixed, where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. the book of Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were, many, there were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says that the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter to you, to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise. A rattling, and the boy and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and then the breath came into them. And they lived and stood in their, and stood on, their, stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the, are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our home is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord, when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord, the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to be to God. And this psalm this morning is Psalm 130. Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear, hear my, my voice. voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. 
If you, Lord, were to note what is done in us, O Lord, who could stand? For there is forgiveness with you, therefore you shall be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits for him, in his word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen in the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. With him there is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem all Israel from all their sins. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed it cannot, and, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through the Spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. is number 482. Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory, Glory to, to you, you Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. 
Rather, it is for the God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you and you're going there again. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of the world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told him, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus, is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been dead in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you Lord. Lord Christ. Amen. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This story of the raising of Lazarus, found in the Gospel according to John, that we heard this morning, has become one of my very favorites, because I think as I look back at our life together, it describes what we have been about, as well as what you will continue to be with Charlie Canute joining you to begin his ministry among you as your rector this coming Wednesday, April 1st. Quite simply, this is, of course, a biblical story with the central figures being Jesus and Lazarus, but it's also really about us. One of the interesting things that probably has occurred to you, as it has to me, as we look at our lives, is that while Jesus showed up intentionally at our baptism, he also has continually made his way to various tombs in which we sometimes find ourselves residing throughout our lives. And so time and time again, Jesus arrives and calls us out from darkness, judgment, and guilt to be free of the power of sin and the sting of death. Indeed, that happened once and for all at our baptism, but we need to recall it, it seems, just because we can sometimes forget that we are loved so intensely. And when we are drawn to remember this love, one of the consequences of discipline, worship, prayer, and companionship in Christ is that we can become overwhelmed by joy, even joy which can conquer the despair the world is experiencing now with coronavirus. And that shouldn't surprise us, because after all, celebrating our being unhindered by alienation and separation, one of the great themes of Lent. This is the season, after all, to get rid of all the junk that interferes with wonderful relationships we have right now with one another and with God. And that leads us to rejoicing. Now remember, rejoicing is not shallow giddiness. Instead, it is leading from the heart, aware of the stupendous grace of God. So, Revel in breaking the fast today. Put on a Hawaiian shirt, and if the Dairy Queen's drive-in window is still open, have a triple chocolate brownie with its vanilla soft ice cream slowly melting down its sides. Not unlike Lazarus, you and I are the beloved. And if you have trouble being convinced of that, then remember, as St. Paul wrote, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And as we all know, nothing means nothing. So indeed, celebrate. Like our unlikely likely hero Lazarus, being raised from the dead, equally stand unbound of all of that which gets in the way of such a fact of life and revel in the grace of God. Yes, that actually is appropriate behavior during the Sundays in Lent for those of us who again become to know ourselves free of that which can confound us mightily and who through our Lenten disciplines have rediscovered something fabulous. That's the joy we are talking about that is available for all, no exceptions, upon our being ushered away from the tombs. As I think about us, when we are operating on all cylinders, this is who we are, people raised from the dead, having exited a myriad places of captivity in a world desperately in need of being convinced of the good news prevalent to all, for we know better than to ever allow a stone to be rolled up, sealing us in. Now, some might be saying right about now, that poor man, it's a good thing he's retired, as he seems confused, perhaps having looked at the wrong day on the calendar. Easter, after all, is two Sundays from now. Well, you're right about the calendar, as Easter is indeed 14 days away. But we live and move and have our being, to borrow a phrase from the 17th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, totally and always enveloped by the Easter event. 
And so when you hear the story of the raising of Lazarus, you can't help but think of Jesus and that blessed first day of the week. Therefore, Lent is always a time to rediscover Easter, which resides inherently within you and within me. Given that we have indeed been raised, Lent's trick for us is to get us to live that way, which admittedly can sometimes be a challenge, if because of nothing more than the dailiness of life. It can wear us down. So, Lazarus, walking out of his tomb, actually describes who we are. To put it another way, we have all died in the waters of baptism, and we now are raised to new life, enabling us to do one of two things. We can go to the club of those who have breached the grave and sip brandy and smoke cigars and simply applaud our good fortune. Or we can put on our hiking boots and journey to graves all over the place, act as the body of Christ that we already are, and make it possible for other people to emerge from their tombs at last, unfettered from alienation and separation. And exercising this calling is more important than ever during these distressing times in order to bring good news to all of those who are anxious and suffering. So, how do we go about doing that? Well, it's not rocket science. Turns out that you've been doing this ministry all along. Just think, over all the years, of all the wonderful agencies this church has helped from contributing the offering from Christmas services to the special Lenten community contribution to various ministries within the Flathead Valley and the surrounding areas. This year, focusing on the Abbey Shelter, which comforts abused women and their families, and the Warming Center for the Homeless, which is housed now in the basement of Christ Church in Kalispell. For so many who have been beaten down Literally and figuratively, you've made it possible for them to leave behind hopelessness, cold, isolation, and its companion, loneliness. That has been you to a key as people raising the Lazaruses all around us. Over the last 13 years, we've also rolled rocks from the entrances of tombs, and out of them, dogs and cats have run with excitement and joy just because we engaged in that most proper Lenten activity, playing golf in the snow, which this year, caution concerning the coronavirus, caused us to postpone all the festivities until later on this summer when it's safe. Oh, indeed, I mean that with every bit of seriousness. After all, what we have done over the last years was an outward and visible sign of inward and spiritual grace. Traipsing around in the mud, hitting golf balls into the street, trees, snowdrifts, one another, and occasionally onto AstroTurf greens was what passerbyers could observe of us. That's what was apparent to them. The unseen and sacramental godly work, however, was our actually helping others in our valley and on the reservation alleviate the suffering of homeless and abused dogs and cats. Again, over just these f f last five years or so, we've raised around $30,000 to give hope to our stray four-legged friends. So, dear friends, honor Lent and call all of the Lazaruses you see out of the tombs and witness the dead walking again. A very, very simple way to do that, for example, during these times, is to find a waiter or waitress now out of work that you've grown to love over the years and send him or her the tips they would have made off your dining in their restaurant. Tell them you care and give them their phone number to call. Such a gesture could be joyfully immeasurable to them. That's the kind of thing I have seen you do over these last 15 years to free the oppressed and the captive. That's what you have done to be Jesus. And now you enter a new future equally as vibrant and as exciting. 
When I lived in Seattle four decades and some change ago, I used to go to this hole-in-the-wall used record store in the U District presided over by a very elderly woman and her cat. One day, for six dollars, I bought a box set of records which contained the three symphonies of Sergei Rachmaninoff, played by Eugene Ormandy, conducting the Philadelphia Orchestra. At the bottom of the cover of the box containing these LPs, which I still have and often play, is this quotation of Rachmaninoff saying, when I think of composing, my thoughts turn to you, the Philadelphia Orchestra, the greatest orchestra in the world. Back in the 1930s and 1940s, he would write some of his works specifically for this orchestra. Because of who you are, and beginning in but a few days, your brother in Christ, Charlie Canute, will begin to compose new thoughts of ministry to be played by you in a world pleading for what you know to be true deep in your bones. Now, given the fact that he has just come from California yesterday, he probably is confined to quarters until just before Easter, but rest assured, he will emerge filled with vim and vigor, ready to rock and roll. And as a result, because of who you are and have been since 1895, he will be stunned by the most extraordinary music orchestrated by you with him. Together, guided now by his wisdom, compassion, humor, vitality, relative youthfulness, scholarship, his having a dog, and most importantly, his conviction in Christ, as well as being blessed and buoyed by his partnership and love with Michaela. You all will find yourselves moving from tomb to tomb, just like Jesus, encouraging people to get up and get out, unfettered to enjoy life drenched by the exuberant abundance of the blessings of God. How can I be so confident in saying this? Well, dear friends, I know from where I speak. For when I think of ministry among these towns in which we reside, and the wider world in which we find ourselves, not unlike Rachmaninoff and his love of the Philadelphia Orchestra, my thoughts turn to you, the greatest parish family in the world. Have a blast. For the angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven are urging you on. Join them and mightily cheer together, because as we all know from our life together in Christ, glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Amen. Turning at home to your prayer books, on page 358, we find the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, on the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 
We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Prayers of the People are Form 2, found on page 385. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our Bishop Marty, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the Church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask for prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask for prayers for all who seek God or a, deep, or a deeper knowledge of Him. Pray that they may find and be found by Him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. In particular, this morning, let us pray for the repose of the soul of Larry Martin one of the 2,000 who have died of the coronavirus in this country. I ask your prayers for all those on our intercessory prayer list and those serving in places and occupations in which they are in harm's way. I ask your thanksgiving for Father Charlie's safe arrival in Montana. For our being able to connect with one another through social media. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have, gra ha have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. This morning, as doctors, nurses, technicians, administrators in hospital all over the country, and indeed here in Montana, struggle with meeting the demands of providing medical care to those stricken with coronavirus, let us intentionally pray for them that they may be given the stamina they need, as well as protection from the virus itself. We have prayed, we pray for those healthcare workers that have contracted this illness, and for the nurse in this country who died of it. We pray as well for the hundreds around the country, healthcare, around the world, who have also died. Let us also pray for those patients who need various treatments and surgeries, but have who've been asked to wait because their operation or their beginning of cancer treatment is not as desperate as the needs of others. Let us pray for the doctors who have to decide who gets in and who has to postpone receiving treatments, along with making the hard choices involving terminating treatment so that machinery can be given over to others with a better chance of recovery. Let us also pray for administrators who have to contend with shortages in personal protective equipment and hospital beds and ventilators and the like. And finally, because of precautionary isolation, let us earnestly pray for those stricken with the disease and who are isolated from their family and their religious communities. From the Book of Common Prayer, Sanctify, O Lord, those whom you have called to the study and practice of the arts of healing and to the prevention of disease and pain. Strengthen them by your life-giving spirit that by their ministries the health of the community may be promoted and your creation glorified through Jesus Christ our Lord. And O God, whose mercies cannot be numbered, accept our prayers on behalf of your servants who have died from this disease and grant them entrance into the land of light and joy in the fellowship of your saints through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God now and forever and almighty God father of mercies and giver of comfort deal graciously we pray with all who mourn that casting all their care on you, they may know the consolation of your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now continuing on page 360, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor.
most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day, now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 473.
Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.